ladies and gentlemen, the topic for panel one is ages of soft from a historical perspective. And the research question guiding this panel's discussion is, what are the major historical lessons from each previous age of special operations and how can they be used to prepare for the future? Moderating this panel is Mr. John Melcon, a former U.S. Army Special Forces officer and Princeton University graduate who currently serves as the head of the Center for the Study of Civil Military Operations at the United States Military Academy at West Point. Mr. Melcon, the floor is yours. I'd like to just sort of look at, uh, to open up our discussion and to continue on Ike's theme of sort of history and how it informs, um, because I think that the intro that he gave us really sort of confirms the old uh, Lord Byron maxim that the best prophet of the future is the past. And I want to look, take a look. There was a study that was commissioned by Major General Julian Johnson, or excuse me, by Major General Julian Thompson at the uh, uh, King's College War Studies Program. And it revealed that many senior officers in the Royal Navy during the period before the First World War had dismissed a lot of their history as irrelevant. Um, in their opinion, there was nothing that a steam-powered uh, steel warship early 10th, 20th century Navy could learn from the wind-powered and sail-powered wooden ship Navy of the past. So tactically speaking, they were correct. Um, however, I think they ignored the human factor and especially the lessons that were learned from the way that those 18th and 19th century commanders had exercised command, um, which is very much a human factor. The outcome of this was a rigid command system um, one that was a significant factor uh, in their inconclusive outcome, um, not only at the Jutland, but uh, also in many of their uh, surface actions uh, throughout the North Sea that had preceded that. Um, similar to land commanders, um, armed with newly emerging technologies, uh, things like a water-cooled machine gun, things like mechanic mechanized vehicles, things like air power, things like even the introduction of, uh, of chemical warfare had sort of lapsed into a mode of thinking um, that it sort of eschewed most of the evolutions in maneuver that had been learned previously. And thus, they found themselves sort of stuck uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a mode of warfare that was ineffective um, and, and, it's, and ignored in many ways a lot of the uh, intrusive technologies going back to the pikes, the phalanx, and even the longbows that for many years had helped us to develop, help us as, as, uh, as warriors to develop a, uh, an effective scheme and maneuver. Um, and I think that this is emblematic of, of you know, what still remains, um, even as a retiree who's now teaching the next generation of soft warriors, uh, the importance of the soft imperative of humans being more important than hardware. Um, as I sort of was inspired as a youth um, by a, uh, a copy of Robin Moore's Inside the Green Berets by my uncle, who was a Vietnam veteran, and then later on went to pursue uh, studies as a history major uh, at the undergraduate level. Um, I began to become uh, a little bit uh, concerned with the fact that I did not see a lot in the way of history or study of military history as an integral part of education. And as we all know, uh, the, the broader body politic being informed of military history is absolutely vital for a, a society to be able to be effective in its, uh, in it, not only its military pursuits, but in all of its governance. And I sort of observed this break and shift that had happened. Um, we had a number of World War II generation professors that were uh, still focused on it, but I think that there was sort of a, a break that occurred in academia and it's unfortunate. And what I sort of felt was, what was this lack of attention? Why was it happening? And the quick analysis, which we always fall back on, I think it's absolutely manifest, was that there was a direct response to ambivalence from the Vietnam War. Um, the public perception, you know, certainly from my youth in the 1970s, was that we had lost a war that, you know, for all accounts, either on an ethical or a practical basis, we probably shouldn't have engaged in. Um, and many viewed in the university system that it was some sort of a black moment that should never be repeated. And so rather than having a cathartic moment um, whereby we could have a prudent and an informed review of it, I think that there was just sort of this notion of uh, uh, let's ignore why these wars started, let's ignore why they expanded, let's ignore why we ultimately lost. And in many cases, it just became sort of an anecdotal response for, uh, for the failures of, uh, of, 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 of a greater nation. So I think this pessimism then continued on when you start to get into the Cold War, right? So having sort of, again, come to uh, uh, my entry into the military under much of the leadership that had served in Vietnam, that first age, or that second age rather informs it, but that the follow on to the second world war and the first age, I think was also uh, a key factor. Um, we had this sort of uh, this stymied academic interest. I think that was promoted by this notion of mutually assured destruction, which feared uh, caused fear in everyone. 
Uh, there was this sort of ominous shadow that hung over that. You have famous quotes from the area to include Kennedy, who had warned that mankind must put an end to war or war will put an end to mankind. And all of this was sort of viewed as something that was so destructive and so heinous and that there would be no moral equivalency with which, with which we could actually go ahead and examine those conflicts of the past. And so this worrying about more mundane technologies or the emergence of different ideas and doctrine, uh, particularly in the areas of counterinsurgency, another thing that emerged in the mid 20th century, uh, just became a, uh, a minuscule or almost ig uh, ignorable when compared to this sort of potentially cl cataclysmic outcome that could come from a, uh, an enforced nuclear Armageddon. And then I think that, that the zeitgeist of that 70s also offered up this rather utopian view of what society was and how it should reject conflict. Um, for many of the outspoken critics, uh, many of which I encountered on Ivy League campuses in the 1980s, there was this sort of, uh, there were an extension of that first year in, 19, in the 1960s and 70s. There was this sort of notion that it's amalgamation of government, of education, of economics, of big business, of uh, even education and religion together had failed our communities. And that this notion that there was a conformity and a coercion um, had, had been forced us to abandon what many perceived were our, 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 our pacifist uh, uh, selves. But I think that, you know, to claim that wars occurred because they were either by bad men or in fear or in pride, you can go back to Thucydides and look at the, uh, uh, the motivations for war and its creation, or whether it was just seeking power, status, or control, there was this notion that you know, good men had not done enough to prevent them. And that, that this inability to act sort of was promoting a, uh, uh, a natural and a peaceful coexistence that could happen. And so the question uh, even uh, that was offered by Gandhi, and I, I think that these observations are relevant, uh, he said, what difference does it make to the dead, the orphans, and the homeless, whether the mad destruction is wrought under the name of totalitarianism or the holy name of liberty and democracy? So throughout, again, uh, uh, throughout this age of soft, I think you have just sort of a general shift within the, the greater public and within academia and the discussions that were going on with regard to the usefulness, the utility, and even the ethics and morals of war that go on. So where does that leave us for today? Um, I constantly loosely quote Trotsky in my classes to them, uh, informing them that they may not be interested in war, but it is probably infinitely interested in them. And I think that it's a reminder to all of us that in, to ignore history is for us to be able to miss out on those human aspects of our evolving responses to conflict. And that I'm grateful that our panel today uh, resembles uh, and has each individually taken on that ability to face that harder right, to be able to serve, to react, and to respond to the challenges that each of them have faced in their time and against the uh, contemporaneous uh, uh, environment in which they operate. Because as George Patton said, prepare for the unknown by studying how others in the past have coped with the unforeseeable and the unpredictable. And in that regard, I think all of us today have our uh, uh, unique perceptions and a unique ability to uh, uh, inform uh, uh, what, what the fourth generation will look like. And so to begin there, let me start with Michael Island, uh, who uh, is a graduate of the United States Military Academy in 1961, was uh, raised uh, under that sort of first generation, and then went out, was nurtured in his own uh, experience in the Vietnam War in the, uh, in the second age. And I appreciate your contributions today, Mr. Island. Thank you, John. I guess I'm a relic of a history that you uh, talk about. Normally, museum pieces don't get to speak. They just sit there and gather dust. So I'm grateful for the invitation, the opportunity. Um, a few caveats uh, before I start. Uh, one is, uh, first is, my direct hands-on experience with SOF was uh, 1964 to 1974. Some people think that was a long time ago. I'm willing to acknowledge the times might have changed uh, since then. Uh, second, I never served in a high-level soft headquarters. They didn't exist. I never served in a position where I had to think uh, big thoughts about doctrine or other big picture ideas. Uh, all of my experience was at the tactical level. And third, all of my experience, uh, aside from being in the, the uh, mandatory uh, phase at Fort Bragg uh, start was in Southeast Asia, uh, specifically uh, Vietnam, Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia. So my experience, uh, you could say, is through a long and narrow lens with a narrow aperture at, at the end. 
Um, but many years after I retired from the army and in my second career, and even after when I worked on a contract basis, I had the opportunity to work alongside the same Jesodif uh, for 15 or 16 years, since before it was a Jesodif and after it was a Jesodif uh, for that matter. Um, so I was able to observe um, and uh, listen. And I think that that experience gives me some limited ability to uh, compare and contrast then and now. Um, also, you won't hear me say much about Naval Special Operations or Air Force Special Operations. That's not because of any lack of esteem or regard. It's just that because during my time, uh, Army Special Forces was by far the dominant feature of the Special Operations landscape with the other two uh, just sort of getting started. Um, and there certainly was no joint doctrine worthy of the name. Uh, I came to Special Forces. Uh, you, you asked about what inspired uh, people. And I came to Special Forces uh, a couple of years after President Kennedy made his uh, visit to Fort Bragg and became infatuated by what he saw there. And that inspired a lot of people to uh, volunteer for Special Forces, including some who shouldn't have. Uh, but that's not what inspired me. What inspired me was uh, during my first uh, tour as a lieutenant in the Army, I was in an artillery unit in Germany, and I walked into my orderly room one day, and there was a staff sergeant standing there with a beret on. And I was to find out that he was from the 10th Special Forces group down the road. He uh, talked to me for a long time. He was there to see a friend of his uh, who uh, was in my battery. And at the end of our conversation, I was uh, convinced that I wanted to be around people like him. So a lot of people were inspired by President Kennedy. I was inspired by that staff sergeant, and I wish I had gotten his name. So I put in my packet as soon as I returned to the US. And uh, here I can, I think, uh, lay out a difference. In those days, for a regular Army officer, an assignment to Special Forces was the polar opposite of career enhancing. And I got a lot of advice, uh, friendly and otherwise, uh, trying to persuade me to drop this uh, foolish idea. Uh, one I got from my assignments uh, manager in Washington was, if I persisted in this, I could even be given recurring assignments in special forces. I said, oh, cool. So I did persist in it and uh, went to Fort Bragg to the special forces operations, uh, special forces officers course, as it was called then. Uh, all of it crammed into six months because of the Kennedy buildup and the rush to get people in the pipeline to Vietnam. And when I finished in 1965, um, all of my fellow graduates and I started throwing elbows to see who could get on a team uh, for Vietnam. Um, I should backtrack a little bit and say that the attitude of the conventional army towards special forces meant that special forces uh, attracted a lot of uh, mavericks and um, unconventional personalities and admittedly some rogues and some misfits. And that was true in both officer and NCO ranks. Um, but anyway, I got a team that had no rogues, no misfits, all very good. We were a mixed bag of newbies like me and people who had uh, a lot of experience in Vietnam already and a couple of uh, Korean War veterans, including my team sergeant, uh, the legendary Richard E. Pegram Jr. from Yellow Rabbit, Mississippi. Um, we began a three-month uh, pre-mission workup. The training was very good, with one exception, and that was language. And I'm going to return to that in a little bit. Uh, we landed in Vietnam in uh, March of 1966, reported the 5th Special Forces Group, and were directed to go and uh, install a new camp on the Cambodian border. Uh, with a mission of border interdiction. 
So we either recruited ourselves or had sent to us about 300 indigenous uh, troops, um, ethnic minorities and religious minorities who formed our strike force. Um, and I say our mission was border interdiction. Frankly, we spent most of our time defending ourselves, but it, it was an exciting time. After about eight months there, um, I was relieved of command. That is, I was fired along with my team sergeant. We were fired because of a dispute with my Vietnamese counterpart over uh, his handling of funds that I would funnel to him for uh, purchase of rations for our strike force. Now we have to accept a little bit of leakage as an operational necessity, but th this was just getting out of hand. And no amount of um, jawboning I could do would stem the hemorrhage. So I asked uh, the team sergeant uh, what he thought I should do. And he said, well, just stop paying them. And I said, if I do that, the troops will go hungry, they'll mutiny. And he reminded me that nothing I had tried had worked. So I stopped giving him money. The troops understood what was going on. And I'm sure they were hungry, but they continued to go on operations. But my counterpart reported up through his chain of command and um, Sergeant Pegram and I got a message from 5th Group Headquarters saying, uh, report to Group Headquarters for a, a new assignment. Well, once again, I followed his advice and uh, he said we should engineer those assignments before we even went up to the group. And we did. He got into Mac V. Song, um, where he was killed about nine months later and I into something called Project Gamma, which was a newly formed operation uh, conducting cla uh, clandestine cross-border operations into Cambodia. And there were a lot of uh, adventures there as well. When I left there about 10 months later, I turned over my uh, command to an another captain. Um, not too long after that, uh, he shot and killed, that is he murdered, one of our key uh, Cambodian team members. I'm going to return uh, to this as well. Um, I had heard of MACV SOG, but I didn't know exactly what they did. Their, their OPSEC was actually pretty good in those days. All I knew was it was exciting and I wanted to be there. So I wormed my way into, uh, into SOG and I was right, it was really exciting. And I spent uh, the better part of three years uh, until I left Vietnam uh, for uh, special forces in Thailand with SOG. Uh, some of the most innovative and creative uh, and brave people I ever met were, and will ever meet, were in MACV SOG. Um, what, what about lessons? First, I think that uh, most of the lessons, many of the lessons that we learned the hard way in the prehistoric age uh, have already been assimilated and applied to the betterment of SOF. And the most obvious example to me of this is in personnel assessment and selection and training. As I mentioned, we attracted uh, some unconventional personalities and some mavericks and some rogues and misfits, and not enough was done in the uh, rush to build up and get people to Vietnam to separate out the misfits and, and the rogues. And I think that the rigorous assessment and selection process now is, uh, is just a wonderful thing uh, to watch. Um, my second observation is maybe a little bit more critical and it has to do with room for initiative. When I was working alongside that uh, Jasotif in the OOs and, and the 1Os, um, people would sometimes ask me, they say, old timer, what's the biggest difference between then and now? And my answer was um, one word, and it's communications. The communications capability of SOF today is just unimaginable. It's just awesome. Can talk to anybody in the world at any time, it seems, and that is a huge advantage that you have uh, compared to our times. It's uh, also, uh, in my view, a disadvantage. Um, 
when I had my first team, uh, we were on the Cambodian border. We sent our daily sit rep by sending uh, CW, five letter groups, hand encrypted using a one time pad. Not a lot of word, uh, time, uh, space for extra verbiage. Um, never in my most fevered dreams would I have imagined that in my lifetime I would be able to see a flag officer in Hawaii reach out to a team leader on a remote island in the Sulu Sea and conduct a conversation on TV and color TV, which wasn't even a thing in 1966. Um, so I, I stand in awe of that capability. But um, I pose the question, which team leader, that gentleman in, um, in the Sulu Sea, uh, or me on the Cambodian border was freer to exercise initiative and to take risks. And I'll leave that as a question, but I think the, to me, the answer is obvious. Um, let's see, my third observation, what was my, what was my third observation? Oh, the principle of war that the, uh, U.S. military violates the most enthusiastically, in my view, is simplicity. Um, MACV's song, according to the doctrine of the day, was uh, the Joint Unconventional Warfare Task Force for Southeast Asia and Yunnan Province of China. It was commanded by an Army Colonel, 06. He had an Air Force deputy, also a Colonel, 06, and that was it. There were no more colonels, uh, certainly no generals. It was a very large geographic area and a very uh, varied uh, set of missions that uh, SOG had. And I think we did pretty good. Uh, I know we did pretty good. And I'm not convinced that beyond a certain point, adding additional layers of command and large staffs and headquarters uh, adds to efficiency and effectiveness, and with apologies to those people who are members of large staffs. Um, my fourth observation, and, and getting down to the end, uh, is my pet peeve, I suppose, of language. I mentioned that our language training was superficial at best before we went to Vietnam. Uh, and I know that's changed a lot, and there's more emphasis, but my sense is that there's room for even more emphasis on uh, acquiring language capability. And the operational benefits are quite obvious. Um, finally, and uh, to close on a rather somber note, it sort of pains me to say that, in my opinion, um, the soft in my day had too many individuals who exhibited lapses of ethical or moral or professional uh, behavior. I think that uh, my commander, who relieved me, um, exhibited at least one of those uh, lapses. Uh, not because he relieved me, my feelings aren't hurt. Uh, it opened other doors for me and didn't hurt my career, obviously. Um, but because he could not see what the indigenous members of the strike force could see as a matter of principle. Uh, was a matter of principle. I think that uh, obviously I don't need to characterize any further uh, the murder that was committed by my replacement. Um, but in fact, he was not the only one who decided that he could be God and decide uh, what defenseless individuals would live or die at his hand. There's. Um, he went to jail, by the way, but was pardoned. Um, and Southeast Asia in general was rife with opportunities for corruption and personal enrichment. And sad to say that too many individuals, uh, both Sof and others, uh, succumbed to the temptation to do that. I know that I have to believe that the pendulum has swung much farther in the other direction now in the intervening decades, but I've seen enough and I've read enough and heard enough 
but I think there's still room for additional emphasis on fostering an ethical culture in SOF. It's not to be Pollyannish, it's a matter of mission effectiveness. And finally, um, I want to say that I stand in awe of the SOF of today, of the people and of the capabilities, and I'm honored and privileged to be in your virtual midst. Oh, so that's it for me. Uh, over. Michael, thank you very much. Um, I think your uh, focus and attention on things like training, education, communications, certainly the language piece is one that uh, you know I, I, I concur with, and, uh, and it, it's very uh, uh, important. I think that most important, though, is I love your points on simplicity. Right, in many ways, in a complex world, uh, particularly even as it relates to uh, the things you mentioned with regard to uh, continuation or uh, you know, working, trying to work with corruption and, and cross-cultural or the lack of cross-cultural continuity that often exists with us and the, uh, and the force we were either working with or against. My own experience in Afghanistan uh, is pervasive. So thank you for your views on that. Um, next, we're going to shift to uh, a little long continuum here in the age. And uh, in particular, uh, Chief Michael Rutledge uh, provides a rare point of view um, as somebody who has operated um, in some of the most uh, elite uh, tiered units, uh, not only uh, uh, in the Navy, uh, but in the Army as well. So uh, look forward, for Michael, for your uh, observations on, on history and learning. Good morning, John, and good morning to the audience. Um, I will apologize ahead of time. I'm speaking to you from a well-appointed hotel room in Phoenix. Um, with the appropriate distractions. Um, I'm grateful and humbled to even be asked to participate in this forum. Um, I do have a unique perspective, as John indicated, that uh, I came from a 30-year career, 12 of that enlisted in the U.S. Navy and the remainder as a warrant officer in the U.S. Army. Um, so I guess, uh, for better or worse, I'm uniquely qualified to speak on the breadth of change and the depth of change that occurred over that, uh, that period. Uh, just a little bit of, of history. I did enlist in the U.S. Navy in uh, 1990, several months prior to Desert Storm, and I enlisted as a helicopter rescue swimmer, um, not knowing exactly what my destiny was going to be. And I did that for three years and was stationed at Naval Air Station in Guam. And uh, I eventually ended up in the SEAL teams, which which there's a slight story to that, but it is building. Um, a book came out at one point. Um, written by a gentleman named Dick Couch, and it was historic fiction, and it was titled SEAL Team One. Uh, and I read that book, and not knowing exactly what the SEAL teams did, um, I was stationed in the Philippines temporarily uh, with Naval Special Warfare Group uh, as well, and trained with some of the gentlemen from SEAL Team One there, and that kind of set the hook. So as soon as I got back to Guam from that uh, Desert Storm deployment, I submitted an application and found myself in basic underwater demolition school in uh, late 1993 or 1994. Uh, graduated in class 197 in 1994 and was assigned to SEAL Team 1 where I spent the next eight and a half years and did uh, three contingency deployments. I was, uh, every guy that walks in, at least SEAL Team 1 that walks in that's over 200 pounds, they immediately assign you an M60 and that was my primary job was an M60 gunner. Um, I also moonlighted as an air operations. So I did all the, uh, the free fall and jump master and, uh, all those other duties and uh, culminated with, uh, I was an advanced training instructor um, for a period of two years, which was the only time my wife and I were actually able to conceive a child. And then went back into a platoon as a platoon leader uh, or a team leader and uh, was deployed in uh, 2001 and was actually uh, deployed during uh, September 11th attacks in 2001. And we returned in February of 2002 um, and I did a very short stint back in uh, training cells and instructor because I had orders at that point um, to the uh, Army Warrant Officer Program and Flight School in the U.S. Army. And a slight story about that was, and I'll get into it in kind of the meat and potatoes of um, my career change, was that uh, it was a very, uh, with the exception of 2001, it was a very innocuous period where there wasn't a lot of direction. We didn't know who we were fighting or why or what we were training for. Um, so I had flown the 160 several times and in particular, um, after 2001, 
and uh, kind of did the, the very naive enlisted thing and how do I get your job? And they said, well, you gotta go to flight school. So that's what I did. So while we were prior to 2001, I think we were in Japan, I submitted an application to go to the Warnox program. And when we came back from our first combat deployment after 2001, I had orders waiting for me to uh, report to Fort Hooker, Alabama in summer of 2002, uh, which I did. And uh, reluctantly at that point left the SEAL teams, um, but had the full support uh, surprisingly from my chain of command and also my peers and spent uh, just slightly over one year in flight school in Fort Rucker, Alabama and immediately received follow-on orders through another process that's beyond the scope of this panel um, to the 160th at Fort Campbell, Kentucky um, for follow-on training as an MH-47 pilot, uh, which I did and spent uh, seven months doing that. And nine days after I graduated MH-47 officer green platoon, I uh, did my first direction action flight as a co-pilot in Afghanistan. And what followed after that was uh, an additional 13 years uh, with the 160th of nonstop combat deployments up until uh, 2016. Um, and I was at 27 years of service and debating whether or not uh, it was time to leave because it certainly took a toll on myself and the family and everyone around me. And uh, I was offered the opportunity to become the commander of the executive flight detachment at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, which I did for my last three years. And I uh, retired in June of 2019 with uh, 20 or 29 years and eight months, which will always irritate me because it's not a, it's not a round number. Um, and that's my OCD kicking up. So what I learned in that period or what I got to see um, was Desert Storm uh, was an interesting, the, what little I got to see of it as an E3 and an E4. Uh, Desert Storm was an interesting perspective because it was the first uh, attempt at using true joint uh, soft tactics. Even though I was in conventional forces at that time, it was, it was all around us um, and very readily apparent who was doing what and why, um, which obviously um, motivated me to become a part of that team. Um, once, um, once I got to the SEAL teams in 1994, um, there was a large period between 1994 and terrorist attacks in 2001, where I always felt, and it was a general sense in teams, and I assume it was the same in the Ranger, Reg Ranger Regiment, and perhaps not Special Forces, because they're so heavily engaged in the uh, Foreign Internal Defense mission. Um, but SEAL teams are, at that time, were always focused on nothing but direct action and amphibious reconnaissance. So at that point, there really wasn't a mission to train for. So we certainly trained hard, um, but it was difficult and it was always challenging to have focused training. Um, so I will say it was very general in nature and kind of became routine. And I think, uh, as Mike said before me, I think we fell into a lull during that period of the 90s of kind of becoming complacent and uh, not necessarily um, we would go through the motions, so to speak, um, which is all relative to, to the people in the units. Um, but there was just kind of a general lack of, of focus and precision on what we were we were training for, um, you know, on, on all all aspects, probably likely uh, physically, tactically, you know, emotionally. So, um, and I'm sure all the other units, to some degree or another, had the same issues. So I think collectively we we contributed to uh, um, to our unpreparedness. I think for the 2001 attacks, I think it was interesting. Um, during that period also, the 1990s leading up to 2001, was that uh, joint soft, and I, and I heard the term, and again, I'm, I was enlisted, so everyone needs to keep in mind, you know, that an E4 or an E5's perspective on, on the strategic level and tactical level is, you know, about the size of a, a toilet paper bowel. Um, however, you know, there, there was an emphasis, and I distinctly remember around 1997 or so, a distinct emphasis on uh, joint operations. Um, however, with the exception of air assets, I very, very rarely ever recall um, us in the SEAL teams doing any joint operations. We talked about it. Uh, we had some doctrine, or we had some doctrine fed to us, but I don't ever recall um, doing any operations with the Ranger Regiment, or you know, occasionally we would have uh, a special tactics squadron with us, um, periodically, uh, Marine Force Recon, something of that nature. Um, but never sustained and never delivered. Um, so I think in retrospect, with a little bit of mileage behind me, is what we were really doing 
across the, the soft board was, as I was told, we were we were building silos of excellence. So in each one of our individual lanes, uh, we were experts in our field. Um, with my recollection, up until I left the SEAL teams in 2002, uh, we were still very much isolated. And when we came together, there was constant growing pains and uh, um, interactive issues um, from everything from tactics and techniques to communications to just cultural clashes uh, across the board. Even when we wanted to, to get along and work remotely, it was always a challenge, uh, particularly if you're throwing together an expeditious um, or expeditionary manner. So 2001 uh, changed that and then our, our follow on combat deployments. And at this time, you know, I went from uh, a E6 to E7 perspective of the soft community and our missions um, to the 160th, which was very interesting because I went from, you know, being my team is the best team and, and everyone else is substandard, which if you're on a soft team, I fully expect you to think that. I mean, we all should. If you don't think that, you're probably in the wrong place of business. Um, so I know that we all held similar values, just wore different uniforms. Um, however, uh, the 160 was an eye-opening cultural experience because, you know, we were uh, soft force agnostic. Um, you know, we, the same level of service and tactics and perseverance was presented to the Ranger Regiment as it was, you know, tier one teams to civilian agencies uh, or even our uh, foreign partners. So that was interesting. And what I learned during that entire period is um, it was unique because I started to realize that there are far more similarities in all the different soft uh, forces and branches than there are differences. And I think you have to have a particular position to be able to see that. Um, Certainly every force has different flavors, um, but they're all the same people. And when you have all the same people driven towards the same goal, uh, it actually works pretty well. Um, during that period, you know, I did get to see uh, pretty much 14 years of, of straight war in Iraq and Afghanistan and some other places, but we'll focus on Afghanistan in particular because uh, that was our, our longest conflict. Um, I remember going on my first direct action there in uh, 2004, I believe, was when I graduated Officer Green Platoon. And at that point, it was right after we had sort of subdued the the, uh, the country or the, the enemy forces there. So there was a slight lull for about seven or eight months. Um, actually, I'll say a lull for about a year in combat operations where uh, everyone was coming off the high of the initial assaults. And then we went into a, a sustainment mode. I think that was we're talking around 2006 or so, when everybody started to realize across the board, hey, this is this is not a surge operation. Um, we're gonna have to start building sustained operations in this country and we're likely not going home anytime soon. And that's when you hear comments like, well, my, my son's probably gonna deploy to Afghanistan or you know, pretty soon we can expect Afghanistan or Iraq to be a, uh, an unaccompanied tour like South Korea, uh, something of that nature. And I think when when members start thinking that way, um, that is a, a strategic dilemma at the highest levels. Um, because of course, at our level, you know, we can't see the, the national strategy or the tactics that are involved, which may be very slow and deliberate. Uh, but when you're just going out flying every single night, um, catching people that you don't deem are actually making a difference, which is, you know, let's face it, anybody in SOF is not driven by money. Uh, largely, they're not driven by money. They're not driven by what you wear in your uniform. We are driven by job satisfaction. Um, so when you start getting to that point, uh, you start running into some pretty pretty serious leadership problems. And then operations start kicking up again uh, in 2007, 2008. Um, and the problem with that that we start realizing is, and up until, let's say, up until 2014, um, you know, combat operations are, are staying relatively stable, but we are going out every single night and we find out that now our enemy is generational. And what a shock to have been on the battlefield long enough to start uh, assaulting targets or, or capturing combatants that are now the sons of combatants that you caught in 2005. Um, I mean, it's, you know, at the time you think that's kind of humorous and you throw things around like, hey, we just, you know, Five years ago, this guy was a tiny Taliban, and but it's a really sombering realization 
that the scope and the, and the length of the combat operations has now created generational combatants. And, you know, the 20 years we were in Afghanistan, we likely have created, you know, just by the sustained combat operations, we've likely created, you know, 60 or 75 years of combatants who, who idealistically will, will always know and understand that, you know, the U S flag is the enemy, regardless of, of what our intent are. So that's kind of sobering and all these things um, start affecting your, your combat operations or, or how you go about um, conducting combat operations. Um, a couple lessons that I learned were, you know, when you're young, uh, you always hear when you're young in the teams, whatever team it is, whether it's an ODA or a special tactics team or a, a ranger platoon, you always hear from the old guys when you get in there, you, you know, my class was the last hard class and you guys are soft. And, and I think that's been going on probably since World War II or earlier. Um, what I have learned with some miles behind me is that, uh, and teenage sons of my own, one of who's engaged in combat operations right now and another one's in a tiered unit um, getting ready to deploy, is that I also believe that nobody could possibly conduct special operations or have the heart or the tenacity or the physical prowess that we did in my generation. And I'm sure uh, Mike's generation felt the same. But what I have learned is that the current generation of SOF is every bit as physically tenacious and capable. Uh, and quite frankly, in many respects, I find them more capable and efficient uh, and willing to work together than my particular generation. And I think they do it differently. And I think that's really the problem with, uh, with legacy soft operators uh, or leadership is that we're convinced that nobody could have done it better than us. And that's just a, a personality thing. Um, but I am, I am truly convinced uh, that the current generation will continue to uh, exercise all of our soft, soft, soft options and, and be the premier forces in the world, you know, and, and exercise the Joint Chiefs directives um, every bit as effectively as we did and, and most likely better. Um, I think something that we also learned was in the 90s, we trained and trained and trained and in our particular profession, both in the SEAL teams and in the 160, we always thought everybody to the left and right of me are the best pipe hitters in the units. And when all you're doing is training, you, you can ratchet up training and the pressure. Um, you can ratchet it up as much as you want and you will, you will get good products. What we found was actual combat operations truly, truly reveal, um, you know, who your, who your core operators are and who truly um, can handle the pressure and the, the scope of combat and special operations. So that was an eye opener as well. And as we all know, um, you know, every organization has 5% or 10% and uh, combat reveals what hard training cannot. Um, so, you know, if we go a decade without, without a war or opportunity to prove that, um, so too does, or so too does the culture of the organization. And lastly, my other lesson learned was, uh, I had prepared, I should have retired at 20, but I retired at 30 and I spent eight years or so preparing to retire. So I was convinced that uh, one, I was completely impervious to what I had done for the last 27 years. And uh, I was also convinced that uh, I had spent eight years preparing. So there was no way that I would falter in civilian life or have any ill effects from, from 30 years and 27 of that in special operations. Uh, what I found was, um, although I don't claim to have any effects from, you know, PTSD or anything like that. Um, however, I have found lots of my peers now that we've started talking, have been retired for almost three years. Um, I think we all as a community have underestimated the effect of a, what a sustained war does to, you know, our, our emotional ability to handle things and organizational. Um, and everybody in the community thinks that uh, it doesn't affect them, but I, I promise that I think it does to one degree or another. We just all find different ways to, to deal with it, whether it's just keeping busy or finding other missions or something like that. Um, anyway, but you can't do that job to that level and with that level of intensity um, without some sort of effects. So with that, I apologize for being long-winded, but I'll turn it back over to you, John. Michael, thank you. And uh, I appreciate your observations. Um, again, I think just from that unique uh, purview that you've had uh, across that, 
that uh, the, that notion of joint operations, which you do, but also the ability to capture a lot of what Mike said. I mean, even the early days talking about the command structure with a little bit of Air Force thrown in with the Army. Um, but more importantly, uh, this notion that, again, humans are more important hard than hardware and that our ability to go ahead and seek out the finest uh, candidates, to train them properly, educate them properly, and to Mike uh, Island's point earlier about uh, you know, holding them accountable for actions and, uh, and having a uh, sort of higher calling on it, that the uh, force will continue to evolve and be successful as they get into the, uh, to the fourth age. Um, with that being said, I'm going to shift over to uh, Shauna right now. Shauna's a graduate. Again, you see a lot of uh, West Point threads running through this by hook or by crook. Uh, uh, I'm happy to say that uh, she's a recent graduate and a uh, fine young leader in the Army who's now found herself down at Ranger Regiment. She can talk a little bit about her experiences um, because she will be this next generation of torchbearer that takes us through this third age into the fourth. And we'd love to hear a little bit about what you're up to, Shauna, and uh, where you see uh, your career trajectory going and, and, and you know what you can learn from all of this history. Absolutely. Thanks very much for the introduction, John. Um, Really appreciate being here today and excited to kind of share in this history and, and the way forward based on experiences that I've had in the past few years uh, in the soft environment and, and the conventional army. Um, I was a 2018 West Point grad, commissioned as an artillery officer, and then moved on to Fort Campbell. Um, served there for about a year and a half where I attended Airborne School, Ranger School, and Air Assault School prior to assessing for JSOC, and then deployed with JSOC as a cultural support team member um, and Operations Freedom Sentinel. And then also Abdul had it as a targeting operations officer um, for a strike force over there for several months. And then upon arrival back uh, at home station, assessed for Ranger Regiment and have been here as a fire support officer since. Um, throughout that about four year period, have seen a lot of different perspectives on what the operational army looks like today and, and what differentiates different parts of the organization. And I think that's the biggest takeaway for what the, the soft environment looks like and the way forward for soft. For Rangers specifically, there, are, there aren't many things that distinguish an individual ranger from the individual soldier. And I think something that kind of goes unsaid is rangers are expected to be durable and able to carry long weights efficiently under pressure for a long period of time. And, and that's something that we do well, but really the things that distinguish us go, go far beyond that. Um, first is this idea of selection and reselection. And that's something that's come up throughout this conversation and throughout history is that these soft elements, the initial thing that, that makes them unique is that they're a specially selected group of soldiers um, and I think that's something that SOF as a whole is becoming more attuned to as time goes on. And we see those selection processes getting longer and more rigorous and also more intellectually focused. It's no longer just, can you take abuse for three weeks or can you take abuse for six months? Now it's becoming, can you not only do these challenging physical tasks, but also perform intellectually? And beyond that, we now have um, amongst regiment and amongst other SOF organizations, not only do our operators go through the selection courses, but our sustainers go through the same selection courses because we operate in an environment where when you're talking in near peer, when you're transitioning um, from an area in which you have combat mismatch, that now everyone needs to be able to com compete in that same operating environment. Um, another unique factor I think that we've seen through the third age of soft into the fourth age is this idea of reselection that just because you've entered into this unit doesn't mean that you continue to maintain without being reselected over time. Um, and that's that's something that makes SOF unique. You don't stay here because of your laurels. You stay here because you continue to prove yourself. And whether that's in a combat environment, like the sustained operations we've seen for the last 20 years, or something as simple as reattending RASP within regiment, every NCO that, that grows up in the range regiment and wants to take a leadership role goes back to RASP and gets reselected. And that's just a way of ensuring that the product staff gives is meeting those professional and physical requirements that we do expect of, of leaders in this organization. I think one of the other distinguishing factors that have been touched on and definitely differentiate um, Rangers and JSOC from conventional units as a whole is this idea of innovation. Um, not only is it, it based on the intelligence of people that we select within, within this organization, but it's also based on an encouragement of innovation within the unit and you look at how units have performed over the last 20 years in the third age of SOF. And doctrinally speaking, there is not that much different from a SOF unit versus a conventional unit. Both have been tasked with DA raids to some capacity. Both have been tasked with similar mission sets. But the things that differentiate them are the areas in which they're able to innovate. Um, Ranger specifically, 
is really known for our medical program. Um, we are the first unit to be able to do the ROLO program on target, which is the ability to transfer warm blood from a soldier to someone else on target through IV systems. And that contributed to zero deaths from preventable injury um, or preventable loss within the entire war on terror. And you think about that in the scheme of history, the ability to prevent any soldier, any ranger, any operator from passing away from a death that was preventable, something as simple as blood loss is a huge capability gain that was really generated by medics on the ground and seeing this need in an environment that was encouraged for them to, to pursue it and find a solution to that problem. And I think the follow on to that is this, this idea of unwavering mastery of doctrine. Um, we definitely toe the line between kind of a conventional unit and a soft unit and seeing whether we belong more to command or belong to the army um, over history has gone somewhat back and forth in terms of the mission sets that rangers have become accustomed to. Um, but I think what's what's changed most recently or what really distinguishes ranger regiments off as a whole is the ability to master whatever that doctrine is that they are aligning to. And what that enables is that enables quick institutional learning. Um, you look at these organizations, what we asked them to do in the second age of soft was not directly parallel to what we've asked them to do in the third age of soft. Um, when, you, when you speak of the historical mission set of rangers, it's always been long range reconnaissance and long range patrolling. And we found in the third age of soft that while that still exists, it looks different. Um, that long reach is not necessarily someone just walking a long way on a battlefield, but it's the ability to seize an airfield. Um, and it's the ability to reach out, touch a target and come back within one period of darkness. And the ability to develop those tactics and perfect them in a short period of time in such a way that's scalable um, is very unique to an organization that allows for this idea of innovation and learning at, at a scalable capacity. Um, I think that also somewhat speaks to the challenges that SOF will see moving forward. Without those constant combat touch points, um, we pose ourselves a challenge of innovating within our own silos where one organization is innovating in such a way that it's not compatible with another and not only amongst different soft elements, but also between them. Um, you look at the different soft, the special forces groups and ranger battalions are all geographically dislocated. So without those constant touch points, you run the risk of one battalion not being able to talk effective to, effectively to another due to different combo innovations. Um, a special forces group not being able to talk to a ranger regiment, which may not seem like a huge problem when we've been focusing on DA raids for the last 20 years. But when you look forward into, into a near peer environment where you're talking about large integrated combat operations, it becomes a lot more challenging and those become very real challenges that we, we do need to address. I think with that, um, the other main thing that we see is a potential challenge for soft moving forward and, and finding that identity again in this fourth age of soft is this idea of the op tempo that we've been expected to achieve. Um, and it's something that we really pride ourselves in, the ability for our guys to work 80 hours a week and be gone 30 weeks a year. Uh, there's a period of time when Rangers were deployed for 7,000 days straight um, around the world. And that's something that is sustainable when you have an organization that feels like there's meaning in doing so. And it becomes very challenging to ask that of your soldiers and of your Rangers when you're preparing for an unknown conflict and finding that that purpose and being able to define what we think that next conflict looks like and what role each soft organization has in that conflict, I think will be critical in maintaining this soft presence and continuing to build it in a way that's effective and competitive in the future. Shauna, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate your views, you know, right now in the present sense, because it's emblematic of sort of the evolution uh, that we laid out um, here. And, uh, you know, just sort of sum that up, at least from my own taking, uh, not, not only as a moderator here, but as a, uh, as a, a very uh, uh, lucky audience member, um, that's that, you know, we started with a little bit of understanding of our history um, and our importance of learning from it and what we fail at or what we uh, risk when we don't. Um, I appreciated Mike's sort of talks about, you know, during his time, not only the lack of uh, current technologies and other things and the ability to be able to do things, um, but the way in which that has sort of opened things up, but uh, got us away from sort of simplicity. Um, and then, you know, I think Mike sort of captured, uh, Michael Rutledge captured, captured a little bit about, uh, as we try to really get into our, uh, our efforts towards jointness, as we began to really work on our interoperability and other things. Sometimes there's a period there that it's trial and error. Uh, there's not always successes. And sometimes there may be some complacency even that did it, that, uh, you know, for various reasons was a force function for why 
um, as I experienced in my own time in 2001, 2002, 2003 in Afghanistan, when we really began jointness at heart um, and ability to have to do that. And then certainly cap at the end here by uh, uh, your insights on this notion of reselection, this notion of innovation and the ability uh, to uh, utilize in innovation as a tool, um, but also that sort of mastery of the doctrine and the ability to do what you said, which is to be able to sustain for longer periods of time. Um, in the essence of time, uh, we've got a little while for Q&A. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and open up. Uh, you know, I just sort of gave a little bit of summation in, in, uh, from my own perspectives, but just to sort of give it back to each of you um, in order before we take some audience questions, I'd just like you to give me just sort of an idea from your own pers uh, perspective, and we'll start again with Mike Island and Mike Rutledge and finish with Shauna. Um, what's the greatest challenge that you have personally faced um, in your particular age of SOF? And from what you've uh, heard about uh, uh, this, the state of the force today and what you do know from any of you with your uh, lingering work and uh, touch points on it, um, is that still an issue today? And Mike Island, we'll uh, begin with you, sir. Well, I'm tempted to say that the greatest challenge, and it's no joke, was the North Vietnamese Army, but that was uh, probably a unique situation. And uh, uh, the challenges were uh, largely, I think, associated with the lack of technology. Uh, I said that that and implied that that was an advantage in terms of giving us uh, freedom for uh, initiative and innovation and risk taking, but it was also hampered exchange of information. And uh, uh, related to that, we had no jointness whatsoever. In SOG, um, we did to a certain extent, but it was all supportive of, uh, of uh, the Army efforts in SOG, which dominated by far. So we had a naval component, uh, which had some interesting operations. We had an air component, which uh, was basically supportive of us. And uh, uh, there was some ad hoc uh, jointness in that respect. but. We failed, I think, to uh, pursue that in the way that we should have. Thank you. Um, Michael Rutledge, for somebody who uh, you know, sort of took us through the, uh, the, the uh, transformational period, the connecting period of being able to go ahead and uh, uh, increase that interoperability, uh, what, what, what are your observations? Yeah, and, and uh, I found it uh, a little bit comforting that uh, Shauna and her era saw it as well is that uh, when you're talking about sustained combat operations, the biggest challenge over a period or over at least the period I was involved with um, was truly finding your motivation, both individually, unit, um, even strategically, finding your motivation and your mission. Um, because, you know, quite frankly, when there's a, a ranger battalion deployed, there's also 160th companies and so on for the rest of the forces. So. Um, the challenges she identified are, are across the board. Um, but when you're that sustained, you you know it only takes a period of a year or two to uh, kind of lose the mentality like the rest of the American public does, lose the the God and country mentality, and this is what we're fighting for. To okay, we're going to make some changes within the theater. To it literally descends down into not to be corny, but descends down into. All right, now we're just going to make sure that everyone we take out tonight comes back. Um, and that has a shelf life, uh, both for the stress it places on the force and also uh, motivation. And so it's difficult at the operational or tactical level. It becomes significantly more challenging um, when you get up to the leadership level. Um, because at the operational level, we don't we don't see all that. So the biggest challenge is is maintaining sustained operations. Um, and with that, um, the next biggest challenge is institutional knowledge transfer or overlap. Um, I think one of the smartest things the soft community has ever done was allowed uh, people at the operational level to remain in assignment and not do the conventional transition period of every two or three years PCSing to a different duty station. Um, I think they originally did it to enhance quality of life and resiliency, um, but what it really has enabled is overlap in between these periods of when there are non-combat operations, you know, you still have guys in the unit, guys and girls in the unit who can transfer that knowledge. So we're not continually uh, relearning or losing those lessons learned. Excellent. Shauna, same question to you. What, uh, you know, what do you think is still 
hearing this and then uh, as well as uh, you know watching the transformation firsthand from your perspective, uh, what do you still feel are the uh, issues that perhaps plague us today? Absolutely, John. I think currently speaking, the biggest issue we face is just focus in terms of what the next fight looks like. There is so many, there are so many global conflicts that have the potential to escalate, whether that's a full near peer conflict or a low intensity conflict that requires rapid response that your day-to-day -day training or even your year-to-year -year training can only cover so many things. So finding a way to task your units in a way, in such a way that they are prepared for what they expect to see when you don't know what they expect to see. Um, it's not a challenge that we faced necessarily in the last 20 years. We largely knew what we were going to face every deployment, what the raids would entail. And while the individual mission might be different, the overall mission set and what we needed to do to accomplish it effectively was fairly consistent over the course of, of the global war on terror. And now obviously seeing what's happening in Europe and, and in Africa and all around the world, we no longer have that common understanding of what the next fight is going to look like. And that definitely drives a higher training tempo for us, but also a sense of uncertainty and what the focus of that training tempo should be and really redefining what different soft elements are primary metal tasks are going to be over the next 20, 30, 40 years. Let me take an opportunity right now, actually, just to, to have a follow-on question to you for that, Shauna. Um, and that's that uh, what, uh, again, in the ability to have a crystal ball or other things, but being at the forward edge of the technology implementation and the creative process that's, that's going to lead us into this fourth uh, uh, age of soft, what do you think you're most excited about for the future? I mean, where, where, where are the optimistic signs that you can see that, you know, we will continue to evolve, we will continue to be the most uh, capable and lethal force uh, that can be employable, you know, sort of any circumstances or uh, in flexible matters around the world as we face different struggles? Absolutely. That's a great question. And I think we are really at a very unique point where you kind of see the meeting of one, a lot of different technological innovation and two, significant combat experience. And I think there are a few times when we've seen these two things match over time. And I think finding a way for those two to intersect effectively is going to be really exciting. Right now we have an extremely lethal force with the ability to conduct precision raids and long range operations in such a way that's been combat tested that we haven't seen for a lot of history. On the other side of that, you have a communication structure that is innovating to such an extent to be able to maintain communications in a near peer environment undisrupted um, and allow for that long range constant interaction and communication of information and intelligence that we've never seen before. And seeing those two things come together, um, we didn't necessarily need it for the last 20 years because we had such a technological overmatch that at the end of the day, you could send a single text on your phone and guarantee that it would get to the recipient. Um, that's no longer going to be the case in the future. So seeing how we combine technology with this combat experience for the future of warfare, I think is going to lead to some very significant innovations and a force that's lethal and effective and efficient in a way that we probably haven't seen previously. Uh, Michael Island, I'd like to come back to you on that one, actually, just because, again, it, for for certainly for my generation, a lot of things that I witnessed uh, that came about, and uh, I'll go back to your illusions earlier about the uh, color television, the ability to go ahead and do it. Um, you know, what, what, what skills, uh, you know, you mentioned the discipline, the, the focus, the, uh, the, the, the need for, for, uh, for cogent communication with regard to one-time pads and other things, which may have been even sort of lost today and a hesitancy enabled by technology and other things. What do you think uh, are sort of the values that you learned or the uh, skills that you learned over the years that uh, perhaps you know still are important elements of what we'll need here, even with the technological changes. Yeah, well, I think of, of course values are timeless, and uh, they're well known to all of us. <laughs> Selfless service um, being primarily primary among them. Uh, as far as technology goes, uh, you know it's it's going to be constantly evolving. It's the use of technology. Uh, that uh, I was alluding to that concerns me a little bit, like the fantastic communications uh, capabilities that I saw when I was alongside that Jasotif and that was in my own organization uh, uh, throughout my civilian career. And uh, <clears throat> it's just that sometimes that capability doesn't always have to be exercised was uh, my point, just because it's there. And giving um, the 
people who were selected through that rigorous process and these really awesome people, uh, giving them their heads, I think, is a big challenge. Uh, giving, letting them have room for initiative and to take risks and even to fail. And that's a big uh, challenge for a commander uh, who can reach out immediately and talk to them. Uh, now, I'm sure that phalanx leaders in the Roman legions uh, complained about micromanagement. And uh, in Vietnam, there was the uh, allusion to the squad leader in the sky with the battalion commander and his helicopter overseeing every operation. But uh, I think that the technology has brought it uh, to a new uh, sort of level where uh, the temptation to do that reaching out uh, sometimes gets in the way of uh, the initiative and innovation of these finely selected people. Thank you, Michael. And that actually brings up a, a good point, something that I hadn't envisioned us actually talking about during this. But uh, Mike Rutledge, your comment earlier, um, you know, I mistakenly uh, often refer to my students here, you know, as my kids. Um, this notion that, you know, I have some degree of parental control or, or, or influence, uh, more importantly, um, to help them to not only learn while they are here, but to go ahead and apply that um, through the lessons learned on my own experience and, and with others, and then being trying to remain an astute uh, uh, you know, learner of, uh, of changes within the environment and doctrine. Uh, let me ask you again, as a father, and uh, obviously, again, you mentioned that they're in tiered units, so you may not uh, be able to talk specifically about what they're doing, but you know, how do you... Uh, uh, you likened earlier to the, uh, the, the seemingly farcical uh, notion of facing a next generation of adversaries within the theater. And now, you know, you fulfilled that sort of uh, fear that we all expressed 20 years ago about, you know, someday my son will be fighting this war. You know, what sort of insights can you express on that? And, you know, in a human way, I think that our audience can understand about uh, the challenges in this business. Well, I will say that I think uh, any father or parent um, who spent a life in, in the military and particularly in SOF, always prided themselves that, boy, I can't wait for my, my sons or daughters to follow in my footsteps. And I will tell you quite personally, that breaks well. But when they're actually doing it and they're actually deploying, um, that just brings it to a parental level and not so much an operator level. And it's the most frightening, helpless feeling in the world. So that is definitely a, uh, an emotional conundrum. Um, very proud of them. And, you know, I think it's always easy to sit in the cheap seats and say, well, they're not training like we did and they're not training as hard as we did or, or they're not prepared. Um, but like I said, I've, being an integral part and I may have stuck my, stuck my head into their training and preparation more than the average dad just because of my experiences. Um, but I find them to be um, trained as equally uh, lethally and completely as, as we ever were. And like I said earlier, uh, in many cases more so. Um, but you do for sure take a, a bigger, um, a bigger interest in the administration and the funding that SOF is getting and, and so on, um, when you have family members involved. Thank you for your, uh, firsthand observations and, uh, and obviously personal investment, um, in that question. Um, I have a question from the, uh, from the group chat, uh, amongst the audience and, uh, Question was, it was mentioned throughout the discussion, the human factor and the psychological factors, uh, particularly during direct action in war. Um, my question would go to uh, any member of the panel which would like to address it first, and that is, what would you propose as mitigation to this dilemma in the fourth age? I'm perhaps thinking we, to Shauna right now because she's the most relevant. That's what I was going to say. Perhaps we can start with Shauna as the... Uh, as the uh, the, the the property owner or the caretaker of that uh, that question going forward, Shauna, how would you uh, how how do you feel that uh, you're equipped or or will need to be equipped to deal with the human factor and the psychological factors? Absolutely, I think it's it's definitely a really pertinent question um, and particularly relevant experience on this one. When I was over with Operation Freedom Sentinel, I was working both as a cultural support team member, which is the liaison to women and children on target and then a targeting operations officer. So it's been my first six hours of the night preparing for whatever mission we may or may not be going out on. And if we did not go out, turn around and, and help with strategic targeting, which presents a really interesting juxtaposition in terms of 
preservation of, of kind of that sense of humanity and the dignity of the people you're interacting with, but also understanding that there's a strategic mission set and there are goals that this task force is tasked with achieving. Um, and I think the way that those are mitigated in terms of weight on the individual operator is just clearly communicating ROE and intent um, and uh, strongly establishing those left and right limits in terms of what your purpose is here and where that line ends. Um, and really, it's, I think, a leader tasking to prevent your younger soldiers, your younger rangers from ever crossing that line in such a way that would be detrimental to their future. And then I think that goes on to communicate that that dignity and respect beyond just what SOF is doing and into the greater operational environment. Um, historically, the Hearts and Minds campaign, obviously, is somewhat of a cliche now, but I think it really does resonate with people who, who operate in the last 20 years that seeing multi-generational warfare is on a human level devastating. Um, and if you're able to operate in that environment with dignity and respect, it at least preserves some level of humanity within that environment. Thank you, Sean, excellent observations. Um, received another question um, uh, with regard to the role of coalition partners in the future of soft engagements and how we can best implement cooperation and training, knowing that no future fight can occur in the capacity of the US being the sole actor. Uh, this is a question I wouldn't mind uh, uh, offering some insights on, um, and a lot of it just comes from sort of my appreciation, uh, my position in terms of instruction here within the Department of Geography at West Point. Um, I came here uh, really as an international affairs guy, um, and then when the uh, uh, placement of my center within the Department of Geography occurred, uh, I quickly found myself wondering, you know, whether this was land navigation or a s identification of capitals or other things, because I really had a sort of neophytes idea of the discipline of geography. Um, but what I have done is I've realized all along that my own soft career, uh, and I'll, I'll even go back to my general purpose forces career as a young lieutenant, a captain in Germany for the first five years of service, had prepared me to be a human geographer, right? This ability to be able to go ahead and not only have a command of the environment and understanding of all the underpinnings and the foundations of what exists within the, uh, uh, the operational environment, which would include geography, it includes economics, it includes history, it includes ethno-linguistics and religion, and all of these things, um, that having a command of that uh, was absolutely paramount in your ability to not only survive, right, but to thrive and to be uh, the, the most equipped uh, and the most effective that you could be no matter where you're at. So I was fortunate that, uh, you know, to get past some of the complacency that, uh, that uh, Michael uh, had it, it uh, alluded to earlier, um, an opportunity to work as I did for a period of time in Okinawa, uh, not only in a joint environment with Marines, with Navy, with Air Force and others, but then the ability to go ahead either through the JSET programs or through the um, some of the mill to mill training that we would do with our uh, allies throughout the region and ability to go ahead and immerse ourselves with them and work effectively. So. You know, that was something that, you know, until uh, a lot of the uh, missions started getting extending out a little bit more to the regular force, until we began to most recently implement our security force assistance brigades, which have done a wonderful job of being able to bridge that gap, uh, was really sort of the domain, the principal domain of the soft world. Um, but I think that the entire force benefits quite a bit from that happening. Um, as we figured out over the last 20 years and any one of the conflicts that we've been engaged in, there's there's, there's limits uh, to what they can do. Um, I think Michael Island alluded to that early on. Right? You never know like whether there's cross-cultural uh, inconsistencies, whether there's uh, corruption, other things that occur. Um, so it takes a very sound and judicious mind um, and, 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 and ability to be not only empathetic, but critical um, with regard to the way in which you're working with, uh, with your partners. So I think that now that we're sort of in this period of time where uh, you know, we would like to believe that uh, we were going to be in a fight for, uh, you know, whether or not we we're going to return to some uh, some some uh, uh, isolationist ideals or whether we were going to go back and, uh, you know, reassess our great power competition, the force. We're actually in the midst of a, uh, of, a of a hot conflict on Europe, which, you know, uh, perhaps some people didn't imagine. Um, I think we really need to take a hard look at it. And we're seeing it play out right now, not only at that strategic level, uh, whereby the NATO and our, our, uh, our commitments to allies and underneath the coalition there um, is at play, but also what do we as the United States, um, after there was various criticisms and other things for our departure from uh, from Iraq previously, and then from uh, Afghanistan recently, you know, what is it for a U.S. commitment to, uh, to, 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 uh, uh, to coalition activities and things going forward. So I think this is where, once again, all these tools we've created, things like the SVABs, the roles of our combatant commands, uh, particularly service component commands, the, the geographic basis is gonna be very important for us to not only maintain those relationships, 
uh, on an in at an individual level uh, between us and our uh, and our allies and partners. But more importantly, how do they fit into a greater construct, which gives us greater reach, greater effectiveness, greater ability to, our, uh, to operate on the ground? And that starts with every individual soldier who has to be open minded to be able to go ahead and get past those sort of uh, uh, those gray areas between the, uh, the the other coalitions that we work with. Uh, I think that about closes up our time. I'd like to thank each of our panelists for their insights, uh, their generational insights, their rich experiences, and their willingness to go ahead and uh, share that for all of us. I think we leave this forum with a uh, pretty good uh, uh, feeling based on Shauna's experiences and, uh, and her pointed uh, comments about the future force going forward that can we rest assured that the fourth age of soft will be just as successful as the last. With that, I'll turn it back over to our uh, directors. Thank you, Mr. Melcon, and uh, to all the panelists, uh, Mike, Mike, and Shauna, well done. Thank you so much for an excellent and very exciting and interesting first panel.